Greetings to all ye charitable siblings. While I was reading this week's chapter in the screw tape letters, <clears throat> my mind was filled with a thousand directions that I could go. I am tempted to just read the chapter and allow it to do its work without my commentary, but you know me. Let me read to you the last two lines of the chapter to kind of ground you before we begin tonight's lesson. Screw tape speaking to Wormwood about the complexities of marriage and of charity in marriage, says, If they notice them, they will be on the road to discovering that love is not enough, that charity is needed and not yet achieved, and that no external law can supply its place. I wish Slum Trumpet could do something about undermining that young woman's sense of the ridiculous. Like I said, there's a lot being said in this chapter that we are about to read, but these last two sentences jump out at me as the cure to what ails you. <laughs> it is simple, but I can see a trace of this sense of the ridiculous in my life ever since I was a child, and I am so grateful for it, and I am so grateful for those that brought it into my life. My grandmother and mother both used their sense of the ridiculous as a marvelous teaching tool, but also as a, a surgeon would use a scalpel. Uh, it was one of the most loving tools that was used in both my grandmother's and my mother's home. They both had the God-given ability to couch very hard decisions and very delicate matters that could have destroyed or lifted up within the ridiculous. They were able to put it all within the scope of the ridiculous, and it was so so life-giving and so wonderful. It was really an art form that they had mastered, and I pray that I have achieved anywhere near their adeptness at it. They could take the most sensitive and sometimes shameful matters and display them in truth and in love for the ridiculousness that they were. I have watched other families handle matters differently, and those that handle it differently many times end in warfare and in separation and in derangement, whereas my grandmother and mother could have a whole room laughing at the absurdity of it all, and love and healing grew from that laughter. Were we going to allow this thing? Were we going to allow it? This slight, this attack, this bad thing, this uh, uh, argument, destroy our home and our families? Or would we all see it for the small and little thing that it truly was and have love and healing instead? And that love and healing always came after we all had a good laugh at ourselves. The world doesn't seem to be able to laugh at itself anymore, does it? It takes everything so seriously. Some things need to be taken seriously, but there are so many things that are just so ridiculous. Think about the culture you live in and the two biggest issues that has had that it has had over the last two decades at least. Sodomy being treated as anything even close to resembling the basic family unit, and which bathroom Bubba is going to use at the end of the day, have been the center of focus in nearly all media and news for over 10 years. Is that not absurd and ridiculous? As though they were our major problems. <laughs> It is serious, no doubt, but honestly, if you can't laugh at the absurdity of those things at the, at the end of the day, then perhaps the sickness runs deeper than I care to even imagine it does. Maybe it does. There are incredibly important things in this world. Things that no one would dare laugh at, but if we can't laugh at anything, then how can we tell the important things from the issues of misplaced pride misplaced ignorant self-seeking and just plain ignorance displaying itself for all to see but we're all too scared to say anything we have been told that everything must be taken seriously and it has dried up our souls there's no better feeling in this world than to suddenly realize that you have been acting ridiculously for when that moment comes, you can be the adult that God intended you to be. You can laugh at yourself, you can laugh at the situation, and you can change course under the mercy and love of God the Father. 
And if you can get the whole family to be able to laugh at itself, then you have just brought a piece of Eden home with you. Nothing more tense than a family with serious adults, serious kids, and worst of all, serious teenagers. And I believe that Lewis pinpoints the issues accurately. I think that Lewis would like us to understand the difference between the negatively stated unselfishness in contradistinction to its chiral opposite, charity. We talked about chiral evil during our long study of the book of Exodus. Chiral opposites are more difficult to define and to vision than pure opposites are. Pure opposites would be in the form of dichotomies like uh, dark and light or black and white. Chiral opposites are different. They're more like right hand and left hand. If you can begin to think in chiral opposites, much of the devil's trickery can be seen through quite easily. Think in line of Lewis's Car Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. In the scripture, we are told that in the end days, good will be seen as bad, and bad will be seen as good. If they were black and white, this could not be, could it? And it puzzled me for a long time. But as I have watched evil work in these last few years, it dawned on me that the devil doesn't create anything. He just reverses it or flips it on its head. Look at his iconography. It is all taking images that already existed and flipping them or turning them backwards. Think about looking in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, you think at first that you see yourself, but that isn't true. And I'm not sure how it's going to work out with the camera. I hope it works out all right. If not, just flip it around. Nothing can be further from the truth. The scar on your left cheek, uh, it's on my right cheek, the scar on your right cheek is on your doppelganger's left cheek. When you raise your right hand, your doppelganger will raise its left hand. It is worse than just being opposite. It is deceitfully opposite. Opposite in every way, but not instantly recognized by the mind. And it's done that way in order to deceive the human mind. You part your hair on the right, but your image parts its hair on the left. So is the devil's tricks, and the devil's tricks take good, and that's what it does to him. That's how he appears as an angel of light, in my opinion. They have the form of godliness, but they lack the power thereof. If you are grasping what I am saying, then you are starting to see how far the rabbit hole goes down. We would be totally lost if we didn't have a map or image or atlas to come back to at the end of the day and be recentered on the truth. God's word is that atlas to truth. If you keep it in your life, if you will find that all the absurdities of the devil begin to show themselves for what they are in the light of God's word and in the power of Christ's blood, the Bible is the spirit of truth that allows you to look in the mirror and know that you are seeing a chiral opposite. The Bible is that spirit and the spirit is that spirit. The spirit works through both of them. It is also this same spirit, the same spirit Christ sent us to guide us into all truth that will keep us upright when the storms are blowing and allow us to know when something has been inverted. Unselfishness is the chiral opposite of charity. Now, unselfishness is a good thing in and of itself, but we're going to have to wait to see what Lewis says for you to grasp what's being said here. I thought about explaining further, but Lewis does such a phenomenal job that I think I'll just leave it to him. After nearly 30 years of marriage, I have to tell you that this one chapter alone is worth all the marriage prep books I have ever read. I'm not sure that I could have understood everything Lewis is saying if I had picked this up the first day of my marriage. But if you are listening today and are just now thinking about getting married, you would be wise to bookmark this chapter and read it every year or so. In it is the secret to a happy life, a happy wife, and a happy marriage. Chapter 26. My dear Wormwood, yes, courtship is the time for sowing those seeds which will grow up ten years later into domestic hatred. <laughs> the enchantment of unsatisfied desire produces results which the humans can be made to mistake for the results of 
charity. Avail yourself of the ambiguity in the word love. Let them think they have solved by love problems they have in fact only waived or postponed under the influence of the enchantment. While at last you have your chance to foment the problems in secret and render them chronic. The grand problem is that of unselfishness. Note, once again, the admirable work of our philo philological arm in substituting the negative unselfishness for the enemy's positive charity. Thanks to this, you can, from the very outset, teach a man to surrender benefits, not that others may be happy in having them, but that he may be unselfish in foregoing them. That is a great point gained. Another great help where the parties concerned are male and female is the divergence of view about unselfishness which we have built up between the sexes. A woman means by unselfishness chiefly taking trouble for others. A man means not giving trouble to others. As a result, a woman who is quite far gone in the enemy's service will make a nuisance of herself on a large scale, on a larger scale than any man except those whom our father has dominated completely. And conversely, a man will live long in the enemy's camp before he undertakes as much spontaneous work to please others as a quite ordinary woman may do every day. Thus, while the woman thinks of doing good offices and the man of respecting other people's rights, each sex without any obvious unreason can and does regard the other as radically selfish. On top of these confusions, you can now introduce a few more. The erotic enchantment produces a mutual compl complacence in which each is really pleased to give in to the wishes of the other. They also know that the enemy demands of them a degree of charity which, if attained, would result in similar actions. You must make them establish as a law for their whole married life that degree of mutual self-sacrifice which is at present sprouting naturally out of the enchantment but which, when the enchantment dies away, they will not have charity enough to enable them to perform. They will not see the, the trap. Since they are under the double blindness of mistaking sexual excitement for charity and of thinking of that the excitement will last forever, when once a sort of official legal or nominal unselfishness has been established as a rule, a rule for the keeping of which their emotional resources have died away and their spiritual resources have not yet grown, the most delightful results follow. In discussing any joint action, it becomes obligatory that A should argue in favor of B's supposed wishes and against his own, while B does the opposite. It is often impossible to find out either party's real wishes. If with luck, they end by doing something that neither wants, while each feels a glow of self-righteousness and harbors a secret claim to preferential treatment for the unselfishness shown and a secret grudge against the other for the ease with which the sacrifice has been accepted. Later on, you can venture on what may be called the generous conflict illusion. This game is best played with more than two players in a family with grown-up children, for example. Something quite trivial, like having a tea in the garden is proposed. One member takes care to make it quite clear, though not in so many words, that he would rather not, but is, of course, prepared to do so out of unselfishness. The others instantly withdraw their proposal, ostensibly through their unselfishness, but really because they don't want to be used as a sort of lay figure on which the first speaker practices petty altruisms. But he is not going to be done out of his debauch of unselfishness either. He insists on doing what the others want. They insist on doing what he wants. Passions arouse. Soon someone is saying, very well then, I won't have any tea at all. And a real quarrel ensues with bitter resentment on both sides. You see how it's done. If each side has had been frankly contending for its own real wish... They would all have kept within the bounds of reason and courtesy. But just because the contention is reversed and each side is fighting the other side's battles, all grudges, all the bitterness which really flows from thwarted self-righteousness and obstinacy and the accumulated grudges of the last ten years is concealed from them by the nominal or official unselfishness of what they are doing, or at least held to be excused by it. Each side is, indeed, quite alive to the cheap quality of the adversary's unselfishness and of the false position into which he is trying to force them, but each manages to feel blameless and ill-used itself with no more dishonesty than comes natural to a human. 
A sensible human once said, if people knew how much ill-feeling unselfishness occasioned, it would not be so often recommended from the pulpit. And again, she's the sort of woman who lives for others. You can always tell the others by their hunted expression. All this can be begun even in the period of courtship. A little real selfishness on your patient's part is often of less value in the long run for securing his soul than the first beginnings of that elaborate and self-conscious unselfishness, which may one day blossom into the sort of thing I have described. Some degree of mutual falseness, some surprise that the girl does not always notice just how unselfish he is being, can be smuggled in already. Cherish these things, and above all, don't let the young fools notice them. If they notice them, they will be on the road to discovering that love is not enough, that charity is needed, and not yet achieved, and that no external law can supply its place. I wish Slum Trumpet could do something about undermining that young woman's sense of the ridiculous. Your affectionate uncle, screw tape. Being unselfish is an achievement, but being charitable is a gift. If you have been unselfish for a month and find that your spouse is not returning the favor, then you are not receiving what you have earned. However, if you are pouring out the gift of charity on your spouse, then all returns are grace upon grace. There is something to be said for being unselfish, but being charitable is a far better path. But just think about how that sits on your mind and the demands it places on you. Let's phrase it both ways. You should be unselfish. You should be charitable. I don't know if I can describe the difference to you or not, but my soul sure feels it. How about yours? Our language has been decimated by the chiral reflection that we call political correctness. We bought into it because in the mirror, it really does look like we are holding up charity. But truth be known, it is opposite in every way. Just think about the world before the language was diluted. Was there more love or less? Was there more patience or less? Was there more laughing at ourselves or less? The devil's lied to us. And in order to defeat that lie, we must take charge of the language once again. We must become charitable once again. And we must step back through the looking glass, back into the reality of the spirit and truth of God. Amen? God bless you, charitable siblings. You are beautiful. God bless.